Facebook Live right now, and bam, just like that, I say it. It's kind of like magic. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is Wednesday. You know what that means with two sisters. It is Wealth Wellness Wednesday. We're going to chat about having a good relationship with healthy mindset, healthy finances, but also really more importantly about paying it for it to other people. Good morning, everyone. This is Carol Sue, a.k.a. Nani Boss, Lady Kiana, live from Vera Beach with two... Sisters, hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Janice, aka Wellness Diva 3.0. Uh, <laughs> we love, love the topic of wealth, Wellness Wednesday. But one little thing I want to address before we really get started, and this is kind of a sidebar. Last week, I had chatted about what is breaking news and what is not. And it's ironic that uh, when I had chatted about that, what? I feel that something good is coming up. Oh, it is. Okay. You know me, right? I got a juicy one too. Go. So at that time, when I was chatting about what is breaking news, and what I had mentioned was uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle had uh, announced the that she is pregnant with their second child, which I think is absolutely amazing. Not breaking news. I do love them. I think he is so much like his mom, and I admire and respect him. And <laughs> I want to say, like, right after we got off of that broadcast, what came across as breaking news? Kim Kardashian and Kanye West getting a divorce, not breaking news. I admit, I like to follow the Kardashians here and there. I don't go out of my way, but when I come across them, I'm interested. I like to see what's going on. I love their fashions whatever i don't go out and seek it but that is not breaking news then of course we had some breaking news yesterday which hmm, kind of is breaking news tiger woods and by the way we just want to um send our well wishes for him his you know he obviously um <laughs> suffered some very traumatic very serious injuries so my heart goes out to him and his family and we wish him a healthy, healthy and speedy recovery. What I didn't like seeing is that there are, there are still a lot of haters out there. With anything, we, I get it. Everybody has their opinion. Everybody has a right under the constitution, free speech to say what their opinion is about it. Now we all know that when Tiger Woods had his um, accident, I want to say it was about 10, 13 years ago, and I could be mistaken on the time frame. It was associated with the DUI, and that's when the news came out of <laughs> his indiscretions, infidelity with his wife. That business is none of my business and should not be anybody's business. That's business between him and his ex-wife. And of course that subject came up again and, there, and I'm like, people, just stop. If you wanna wish Tiger well wishes, I think that's fantastic. But all that he owes us pretty much is nothing unless you go to see, pay a ticket and go see him golfing. I'm not sure how any of that works because I'm not well versed in that area. So that's my two cents on what is breaking news and what is not and you haters we know you're going to keep on hating but you're making a total ass out of yourself just saying hmm. you go girl you go system and then and i concur with that breaking news to me is of an emergency nature while i truly understand the impact that he has on the golf industry as a whole he is a public figure so i would expect that there would be coverage on it of course to the extent that it did bring out a lot of hate, that's where I draw the line. I think it's ridiculous. However, it kind of goes in hand with, you know, people are frustrated. They're on social media a lot more than normal because some people are still in lockdown on a fake pandemic. May I might add there is no more pandemic. Although the person occupying the people's houses press secretary 
use that word frequently yesterday when describing the cages of the children, which they were trying to, they call the cages when Trump is using it, but now it's not cages anymore. Totally different, totally different uh, subject. However, it does bring on people more intuitive to, to watching social media, news breaks, and those kinds of things. And where some may still feel that they cannot go outside of their, their own four walls, they've got nothing better to do than scroll on social media and respond to different things. Now, if it's something that is of importance or you're wishing somebody well wish, totally different circumstance. But sadly, social media does bring out cray cray people, haters, and just miserable human beings. But keeping on the limelight of Wealth Wellness Wednesday, I did have an article that was sent to me uh, by my daughter, actually. And it's because how many of you, speaking of wealth, wellness Monday, talking about finances, a healthy relationship with money, you start at an early age, right? By playing the game what? What game did you play as a child that had to do with money? Well, actually, there was two. I think one took off a little bit more than the other. So can you name that, Jan? What game did you play as a child that we played as a ch child, I think every weekend, because we had forced family fun before it became forced family fun. And it was a board game that had to do with money. Well, there's two that pop into my mind, life and monopoly. Absolutely. I believe monopoly topped life and actually is still very much a part of our family's life as well as it is a part of many others. In addition to the traditional Monopoly game, there are many special editions. There's the Star Wars edition. There's, there's multiple editions out there, which I think is kind of cool, puts a different spin on it. However, because we're in the state of affairs with a fake person occupying the White House, with the whole Black Lives Matter movement, and the whole shenanigans of that nonsense. Now, I wanna make sure that I'm very clear. I do not, I am not saying that black lives do not matter. However, I am against a thousand percent the movement of black lives matter, which is to me a charade of what they were really doing. So that's my view on that. However, because we're in a society now, sadly, that the propaganda and the narrative is all about cancer culture and racism is brought into every aspect, every aspect of our lives now. And I'm not saying that we should not be enlightened, we should improve and you know, racism is not gonna go away. And I don't say that lightly because I think racism is horrible. It's despicable, it's ugly, and it really shows the hatred in your heart. However, there's a time and a place for that discussion. And the article I received, so I'm gonna tie this all together, is an article that came out, an ambiguous racism new attack on the game of Monopoly. So there are efforts that are injecting into a conversation and discussion, which we know that just happens that they bring racism now to every, as every aspect of American life. And now it is touching upon the game of Monopoly. There is a piece, now how many of you can relate to it? You probably want to buy this piece of property, Atlantic Avenue or Atlantic Railroad. I'm not sure which one it was, Atlantic property. I think it was Atlantic property. And what they're saying is, that the board game actually has a hidden dark secret, which has to do with the prices of the property and how it was invented, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so the property values of the popular game are, they're now saying, reflect a legacy of racism and equality because uh, the author of this particular writing that took place, I believe it's in the 1930s, and the author is Mary Pilon, and that's P-I-L-O-N. She chatted about that in the 19, or actually, I think this is a recent article, but she's reflecting on um, Jesse Railford, who in the 1930s, in the 1930s was a New Jersey realtor. 
and I believe uh, he affixed prices to the properties on his board to reflect the actual real estate hierarchy at the time. So that is why these particular names were chosen. And at the time, Atlantic City, uh, with the rest of the United States, there was bitter, uh, they were talking about bitter legacy of racism there, residential segregation, which those things did occur. But they're saying that these particular people had a key role in how you know, the game uh, uh, came about. I don't know if any of this is true. And they also stated that they lived on, ex, um, lived on Pennsylvania Avenue, which we know is a very expensive area. But they had previously lived on, which is called Vent, Ventnor, V-E-N, Ventnor Avenue. And that is one of the yellow properties that represents the some of Atlantic, Atlantic City's wealthier neighborhoods. So they're tying in, you know, wealth and racism into the game of Monopoly, or at least this particular article is. And it goes on to say that the Harveys, which was a family that was, you know, had some sort of input on it, employed a black maid named Clara Watson. She lived on Baltic Avenue in a low income black neighborhood, not far from Mediterranean Avenue, and on the Monopoly board, those prices are cheaper. They come in at $60. Well, let me tell you about Baltic Avenue and Mediterranean Avenue. Game-wise, I always do extremely well with the rent. <laughs> but my point being, and I say that in just because I, I actually do, I always go after those, those particular properties, which are the less expensive properties. But of course, now they're tying in, into racism. And when I think about it, and when I, after got off the chuckle of reading the article, I thought, totally ridiculous. I also want to be mindful that I am not saying that that was not a impactful or that that thought mindset might have gone into the game. But I always go back to, and we frequently talk about Walter Cronkite, he reported the news, I think it was two times a day. I mean, you had it at, you know, in the morning or at six o'clock, whatever it was. And I believe he was mostly on the six, five o'clock news, whatever it was, seven o'clock news. And we weren't over inundated with news. We didn't know a lot what was going on in our government. And I'm not saying that that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think to a certain degree, just like when you're a parent, you don't tell your children every single living thing. You don't tell them, you know, the, the tender age of four years old that the figure of Santa Claus, not the spirit, but the figure of Santa Claus is, you know, in some people's minds, not real. I, however, believe he is real. The point being that if there was some truth to this article, that there was some inflection brought into this game. And now, you know, is it, are we to that point in our society that we're going to pick apart Certainly literature, you know, you, you, you want to make sure that you have current literature in both sides and that kind of thing in history. We don't want to forget history because racism was prevalent back then and it's still prevalent today, even though people want to pretend that it doesn't exist. Racism exists, so I'm not saying that it doesn't and I totally disagree with it. But if we're going to start inflecting and picking apart every little aspect of our American lives, for the end game to be cancel culture, that's where I draw the line. It's not wrong to wonder why something exists, the history of how something was created. I'm all about knowing more. And we always say that knowledge is power, learning about different things. But again, you're forgetting the enjoyment that the you know, when people play a game, just like when they watch sports, they do that as a sense of joy, a sense of relief, a sense of family fun, which I always call forced family fun, engagement, downtime, shits and giggles, releasing some maybe a stressful day, spending quality time with your family or your friends. And they're taking all these different pieces that are very much 
a part of our American culture, a part of American lives. I'm wondering, you know, what's the next thing? Are they going to discriminate the card game Old Maid? They're going to going to find something wrong with Old Maid. Maybe uh, she, you know, was a different race than she's portrayed on the card. Who knows? My point being, there's a time and a place, and we don't have to inject every little nuance of a certain subject only to pander it and then cancel it out. What do you think on that? I mean, <laughs> I oh my know. gosh, I'm ready for a vodka at this point. There's so much I could say, like, just, we just have to stop. The people that are doing that, like, I, I, I applaud them in the sense that they're researching something that is, has meaning to them, has importance to them, the history of it. I get it, but to inject that into every little thing that's like, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? That's control. What about jump rope? Are they, you know, I mean, obviously the, you know, the, the rope has significant meaning and racism, which is again, horrific. It is it, horrible. It's absolutely disgusting, despicable and all of that. But are they gonna take jump rope away now? Are they gonna take away the slinky? You know, it's kind of like a wiry thing. Do they associate that with cages, with wire? You know, because they're all about the, you know, kids' cages. And that was the other thing, totally change of subject, going back to the person that's occupying the people's house's press secretary. Oy. When you are behind a podium and you are addressing reporters, not that I have reporters on a high scale, because I clearly don't, because I don't even think they they understand what journalism is. But again, it, you're broadcasting, you're going and you're addressing your country. There are certain words that have a nice flow to them, that articulate professionalism. And when she was talking about the one picture that was, I believe it was taken in 2014, that they were saying was a reflection of President Trump's what was going on at the border, and they consider this a cage for children, which later had to be debunked because the picture was actually from President Obama's era, not President Trump's. And that same narrative that not only, the, actually both people that are occupying the people's house, the VP, and I'm gonna use that with little quotes there, and the other person, they talked very harsh about that and now they're using that same facility but the press secretary yeah the kids we have to have a place for the kids to go you know the kids need education kids um 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 the kid the, the the kids with you know the pandemic they have to be separate now when you're having a relaxed conversation you might use the word kids but i you know and, the, and this is probably my own pet peeve I would have liked to have seen her show some more reserve, which she lacked. She didn't lack any empathy when she was referring to the kids and not say the word kids, children. You know, there's a certain, there's certain words that articulate better when you're behind a podium. And I, I can't remember how many times I counted that she said the word kids, like 30. And I could be off one way or another, but it was a lot. Well, the kids in the cage and the kids, and it just, there was no flow. There was no professionalism. I know she has been really brutalized in some regards for her lack of articulation. And my suggestion, if you're going to hold a position that requires you to be behind a podium, take some speaking lessons, get a speech coach and learn how to articulate, learn inflection, learn how to emphasize certain words in a certain manner, because we know there are several words that have the same meaning, but when you're in that position, certain words flow better. And I really don't believe that she really got it across. And she actually almost sounded very standoffish that the reporter actually asked her the question. The question was, 
what is the difference between what those two people, meaning Harris and Biden, stated about President Trump versus what they're doing right now? It's the same thing, same building. You're doing the exact same thing. And she got very indignant over that. So, you know, tying in monopoly, racism, children, all these things, how do they tie in with wealth and wellness? They do a lot because they, they're intertwining in our lives. And we have to do a better job to kind of block that kind of noise out and have a good relationship with what is going on in our world, how it is applying to our wellness, and then our wellness spills over to wealthness. Now, wealth, as we know, you have to have a good, healthy relationship with that and paying it forward. And that brings joy, don't you think? When you kind of switch the switch of listening to all this cancer culture nonsense and knowing that I'm not in control of the, the clown show that's going on in the people's house or the clown show that's going on with certain people trying to now make the game of Monopoly, you know, a racist game and rather focus and put my energy towards doing good for others. Don't you think, Jan? Yeah, I think so. But, you know, getting back to Jen Saki, she's sucky. <laughs> is that how you pronounce it? I don't even know how to pronounce her last name. Saki. Saki. The P is silent. Yeah, I like I said, I don't even normally watch her. I the only time that I'll I see little clips of her is with uh, on Dan Bongino's podcast because I could not I could not sit through now when uh, Kaylee McEnany was on. Am I pronounce that right now? I think I am. She was very articulate. She had she her presence had such command behind that podium. She was always always well prepared obviously is a very great speaker was in control of her audience and she just it was just watching pure professionalism with some some zingers and some comedy and really you got to see her personality this person is flat i lose i lose paying attention to whatever she's trying to inject because of the way she art articulates it I have a hard time, and, and we do that too. We're working on that. Most people do, but I'm not paid the big bucks <laughs> like she is. She has a difficult time of knowing when to inflect, when to pause, and I get drawn into the, um, 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 uh, you know, the, the, the confusion, and that's a distraction, and that's why I can't watch her. She, it, she is very difficult to watch, and when I watch her and when she's going through that, I'll circle back, you know, circle back. You know what? You could take your circle back and, okay, let's keep it clean. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I usually shout out to the TV. Come on, man, just spit it out. <laughs> like, yeah, because she just goes on and on and on. And there's no, she's always seems to be fumbling. And I'm not sure why any administration, I would think being a press secretary, that would be one of the criteria that they can articulate well, that they have command of that podium, that they really show all different points of passion, whether it's sadness, whether it's heartbreak, whether it's being assertive. And I don't feel like she's in command up there. I feel she just, she's a floundering flop, like just like a fish flopping around like in shallow water and trying to get to the deep water and she can't quite get there. And I think part of it is she just is not a good speaker. And I, would and I think, you know I, what? I think you, wouldn't you want somebody who represents your administration that can articulate? I don't think she can articulate very well. It's not I don't think she, no, I don't think she can articulate very well because when you listen to somebody speak, when you use Kaylee McEnany, you were drawn in because she was so confident on what she was speaking about. And <laughs> I feel bad for Jen Saki in the point of when she's up at that podium, she does not have that confidence. And I think if she was more prepared and maybe even practice before she came out to the podium, she would be getting her point across or, or what she is trying to 
update the reporters about. Um, I put her in the same class as Chris Cuomo. I'm sorry. I, I think she's terrible. I don't care if she's, um, you know, I don't care what her par party affiliation is. If, if she was a Republic, Republican, I would say she's terrible. That's my opinion. There's a difference. I remember, remember um, what the heck is his name? Spicer. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was not. Now he's on, I believe it's Newsmax. I would say that, again, he did not, I don't think he spoke as badly as she did, but he was. He didn't command a, a good performance either in the sense of, you know, really understanding and, and taking charge. I think he got bothered by different questions. And let's be real, being the press secretary is not an easy job. You're taking, you know, a thousand different questions. Some of them are combative. Some of them are snarky. Some of them catch you off guard and it takes a special kind of person to be able to handle that stress you know the the reporters interrupting constantly them trying to you know make sure that they're the ones that are being called on so i'm not saying what she does is easy by any means it's not but at the same time that is why i feel when you choose someone that for that particular position you want to make sure that one of the criteria is being able to be in command. And I feel when I look at these short little clips, and like I said, I, I've not watched in anything in, a, in its entirety. She looks like she's like a deer in the headlights. She, re, she just does not have a good, strong, confident presence. And she's definitely not postured. She is definitely not postured at all. And I think that's something that for some, comes very natural and others need training and can be trained. It's a matter of just practicing, like you said, over and over again. Right. And, you know, for instance, like today is our, is our 176th episode, <laughs> which is pretty That's amazing. Now, when we first started out, I probably looked like the deer in the headlights because typically I am shy by nature. I am not one to get on camera, more or less be on live on Facebook and then <laughs> plastering our, you know, images on YouTube, I've gotten a lot better. I still need a lot of improvement, but here's the thing. I hear myself. I do listen to um, the playbacks a lot. And what I see is more confidence and that takes time to build. Now I'm going to be 59 years old in a couple months and you know, who knows, I'll be better by then. But the point is, when you when you talk about something, when you want to get share with the world what is happening in the people's house, and you are behind that podium, and we all agree that that is not an easy job, you have to stand there with confidence. I hear myself projecting confidence. This is not projecting confidence. Uh, well, I think that, you know, What's going on in the world today? There's a t there's a huge difference there, right? Absolutely, and I think you lose your your audience, and I think the other distracting piece to that, because I know I've spoken many times behind a podium. If you are not engaging with your audience, you lose them, and then guess what? You're the one behind the podium that can see all these faces, can see all these eyes. You're going to see people rolling their eyes, you know, rolling their head. They're not engaged. You don't have their attention. You're not drawing them in. You're not, you're not, not even building that rapport because in her position, there's a certain amount of rapport that you're building with your reporters and your audience. And I don't think she's doing that. I don't think personally that she would be my choice. And I never want to wish anyone to not be successful. And I'm not even saying that for, even though I, I don't particularly care for her style. And I don't even think that technically she has a style, but, and I don't wish her the worst, but I do think that she does a disservice to that position. And it makes you wonder why her bosses don't see that and say, Ooh, you know what? You're really good behind the desk. You're good at following up with 
information. You're better behind the computer. You're just not quite the person we want representing us. And I'm surprised that that has not come up because we have seen that is one thing President Trump did. Like, you're here, you're not fulfilling what I envision and representing of my administration. So you gotta go. And he did that several times for a reason because he wanted people in positions that he gave them or hired them for to represent the best of his administration. So I think the kind of the joke, the ongoing joke with her is it just seems to kind of go with the current administration, the flip-flopping, the not posture, the like not really people knowing really what's going on there. And I think, you know, and again, it's only been a little over a month and maybe she will improve. But yeah, I don't see it. I hope she will improve. And I think that there, there's always hope. Yeah, absolutely. And I think she has to come up with better terminology than, oh, I'll circle back. That's That's got to go. Well, I think it's, you know, one of those things that their catchphrases, like everyone obviously makes fun of the person occupying the people's house with, come on, man, because he used it. And it might have been, you know, kind of unjust in the beginning, a little funny, showing his personality. But when you overplay a word like the phrase, like just saying, back in, you know, two years ago, three years ago, that was a very popular saying. Now, if you were to say it, you know, people don't think much of it. But if you repeat it over and over again, it makes you almost appear like you're not there's no growth there in your in your vocabulary so in her case she uses and i i don't think i think the last two clips i don't think she used that 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 phrase that catchphrase and that's the problem with catchphrases it depending on what they're meant for if they're impactful if they impact someone's life in a positive way you're going to find people will reuse them or they may reuse them to make fun of you. And I think that's what's happening because in the very beginning, the, at least the, the few clips that I saw, she reused that catchphrase over and over again. And now everyone, you know, and I can't say that, um, and there I'm doing the um, many people will say, if they don't know the answer, I'll get back to you on that. That is fine. But the whole circling back took on its own life of its own. I don't know it why. Did. It did because it showed, in my opinion, a lack of confidence as we chatted about, a right. lack of knowledge, and a lack of del delivery. If you're con if you're always circling back to an answer or to find the answer, it it loses its almost that it lo loses its validity. The other thing that I wanted to touch upon, and we only have actually a few more minutes, but I'm just gonna come out and say this. Dr. Fauci, you gotta go. <laughs> and I'm just gonna do this for purposes, okay? Oh my God, take it off. So for our listeners right now, my sister has got a mask on. Well, here's the point I want to make. Can you imagine wearing, all right, he came out and said, no masks. Yes, you have to wear a mask. No mask. Yes, you have to wear a mask. Now it's double mask. Like, I have a, I have a theory on the double mask thing. And a lot of people actually, uh, it was Jack Lyman and I, we were chatting about it. And he had some, some great insight. And it actually makes sense. So when you think about this pandemic, which I hate to break it to you people, there is no more pandemic, okay? We haven't had a pandemic in a while, a long while. They use that word and again, it's, a, a, it's not doing anyone diligence to keep calling it a pandemic because when we truly go into another pandemic and I hope we'd never do, you're not going to have the same. It's kind of the person crying wolf all the time. If you, you know, Robin Hood, you know, the, the whole thing. No, not Robin Hood. What was it? Was it Robin Hood? No. 
the little girl with the basket, Robin Hood. Oh, that's what her name was, Robin Hood. But anywho, the point being, if you keep saying something over and over again, you lose the importance in the way that it should actually impact you. It should be an alert. This is serious. However, we were chatting about it and we thought how many people initially they had pretty much enough mass then all of a sudden there was a lull in them they mass produced them so our theory we were chatting about it our theory on the double mask and i want to see if our listeners or viewers agree it's because there's millions and millions and millions over in abundance to probably insiders that had information on this pandemic a little bit earlier than the rest of the world went into high mass production and now they've got uh, how, how, you know warehouses full of boxes of masks how are we going to get rid of them we need people to keep buying them right we've got millions into this and we we're going to lose millions if we don't keep selling them all right what can we do double mask we gotta buy double masks. yeah it, yeah it's about creating and cultivating that fear factor which equals control and money Dr. Fauci, you gotta go you suck he does suck he sucks the life out of me his mere presence and i i can honestly say this i don't hate a human being out there but i would have to say i kind of despise him because He's not credible. No one's listening to him anymore. You lose credibility when you flip flop as many times as he's flip flopped on this so-called pandemic. And you lose that, you become irrelevant. And he's very much irrelevant. There is no more pandemic, even though the current administration that is occupying the people's house keeps trying to pander and fear fat fear you know fear monger to people the pandemic the pandemic there is no more pandemic we've been out of this pandemic for quite a while and it's a narrative that they're losing control and they're trying to use i truly believe that they're trying to use this fear factor in ultimating a way of controlling people and that is socialism and communism, people. And if you're not aware of that, you better wake up. So how do you deal with this on this Wealth Wellness Wednesday? Simple. We talked about it yesterday, burst of joy. What is your burst of joy today? Go out and do something for an unexpected person and pay it forward. Whether if you're in a, you know, one of those that goes out for your, your coffee, pay for the person behind you. If you happen to be going out to, to lunch or dinner, you know, leave a little extra for that server because, you know, the, especially the restaurant industry took a hit in this last year. So do that. There are many ways that you can pay it forward to an unsuspecting person. And guess what that does? That not only brings them an unexpected joy, but you feel good about it. You feel good that you just did something for someone that doesn't know you. And you surprise them. You change maybe the course of their day. Maybe they were someone, they were just looking to buy a dozen eggs for their children and just don't have the funds right now. And you went to, I don't know, Wally World or your local grocery store, opened up an egg carton and slipped a $5 bill or a $10 bill in there. And they went to buy the eggs. And, oh, I have just enough for the eggs. Who doesn't open up a dozen of eggs? At least I do. I always open them up because I want to make sure that they're not cracked, right? Now, oh my God, oh my goodness, someone did this. Now I can buy the loaf of bread or the butter. You know, you just don't know what something, a small gesture of a financial exchange with someone that you're not expecting to get anything back can do for someone else's day. And in closing, I hope, I hope that you know, we talk about the curve of what's going on in our world. The way we can really get over the curve is by spreading kindness, blocking out the pandering, the fear mongering, the junky stuff that's going on in our world right now. And we take control of our lives and do something good for somebody else. Kindness, paying it forward is what's going to really get us over the curve. None of all this 
double mask crap. And with that, this is Carol Sue, AKA Naughty Boss, Lady Canna Life from Vero Beach. Gonna get ready to get some pickleball on, get some movement in, and I'm working bands today. So remember, Wealth Wellness Wednesday, don't forget your wellness piece to it, with two sisters. Hey, good morning again, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Janice, AKA Wellness Diva 3.0. We'll be on a little later tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. with another amazing guest. Stay tuned, have a great day, pay it forward. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.